We are in a study on spiritual gifts. This is our 2020. And in verses 4, 5, and 6, Paul reveals something enormously important in biblical history in our lifetime. In other words, in our dispensational lifetime. In verse 4 and 5, he introduces the Godhead called by some the Trinity, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, their involvement in spiritual gifts. The Godhead is involved in your spiritual gift. Now, that's a big deal. That is an enormous big deal. In verse 4, he says there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. In 5, he says there are a variety of ministries, but the same Lord. And then he says uh, in 6, there are a variety of effects or performances, but the same God who works all things in all. And notice the word person is in italics. So there's a role in spiritual gifts of the church and it shows you how important spiritual gifts are in the church. Now, here's what's interesting. Here's what Paul does with the rest of the chapter, chapter 12. He's introduced in 4, 5, and 6, the Godhead's involvement. Now, what he does, he breaks the rest of the chapter down into three divisions. The involvement of the Holy Spirit with spiritual gifts the involvement of the Lord with spiritual gifts, and the involvement with God in spiritual gifts. It's a phenomenal teaching out of 1 Corinthians 12. And if you're not careful, you would miss it. You would miss it. So here's what I did on your paper. I showed you the breakdown that Paul gave us. In talking about this, the Holy Spirit's involvement in spiritual gifts in verse 4, he outlines it, watch this, in verses 7 through 11. That's what we're going to talk about today. Then he comes to the Lord. The Lord's involvement with spiritual gifts, which is mentioned in verse 5, he's going to outline in verses 12 through 17. And talking about God's involvement with spiritual gifts, which he mentioned in verse 6, he's now going to outline in verses 18 through 31. This is a phenomenal teaching by Paul on spiritual gifts. You will never find another place in the Bible better laid out than this. Now, Paul's going to talk about spiritual gifts in Romans 12, and he's going to talk about them in Ephesians 4, and he's going to talk about them in 1 Peter 4. But nobody, and that's where he talks about it. All these writers are going to talk about spiritual gifts in some way or another nobody lays it out like Paul does in 1 Corinthians 12. It's a phenomenal passage. So what I'm going to do over the next th three weeks is I'm going to take each one of those sections and show you how Paul outlined just exactly what is the ministry. And so he's going to lay out what he felt like were key aspects of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the ministry of the Lord, and the ministry of God in spiritual gifts. It, I, again, I can't tell you how important this study is for your life. There's not a person in here that believes, or by the Internet, if you're a person who believes that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead third day, that's the gospel. And Romans 1.16 says, the gospel is the power of God into salvation to everyone who believes it. And Ephesians 2.8.9 says, you're saved by grace through faith and not of yourself is a gift. And in that package of gifts, you're given eight works of the Holy Spirit to salvation because you live in the church age under a new covenant. And one aspect of that eight works of the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit distributes to you. The work of the Holy Spirit is given by eight works. One of those is a spiritual gift. One of those eight works is to give you a spiritual gift. You get it at the point of salvation. You have it whether you realize it or not. How are you going to realize you have a spiritual gift? You have to study the Word of God. It's the only place that reveals them. It's enormously unique for the church age. It's enormously important to your life. It's enormously important to your life. It is your gifted ministry. No one had this before. Not 
this, every believer in Jesus Christ gets a, a spiritually gifted ministry. This has never happened before, ever, where every believer gets a gift, a gifted ministry. Only some got them in the Old Testament, not everybody. Everybody gets them. And not only do they get a gifted ministry, but another work of the Holy Spirit is salvation to take up residence inside your body. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. He takes up residence. And your body now is declared by God to be the temple of God, the naos, the naos, the place where atonement took place. And the Holy Spirit is now there to take this ministry not only to your church but to other churches and to take your life as a mobile church out into the world for Christ. It's an enormous thing. These principles under the new covenant are just phenomenal. And so uh, we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit in verses 7 through 11. He's going to lay it. So let me read 7 through 11 to you. For to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. He's talking about the church now, the common good for the church. For to one, now watch. He says there are nine gifts. If you read 8, 9, and 10, there, he lists nine gifts. Listen to me what they're called. Listen to what he called them. He called them the manifestation gifts of the Holy Spirit. These are nine, man, there are 19 gifts. Nine of them are called manifestation gifts. Do you see that? Well, come, come on. The word manifestation by the Holy Spirit, then he lists them. Are you, do you have that? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm not fussing with you. I'm just saying I'm reading from the Bible, and you're not apparently. That's all I'm saying. To each one is given the manifestation of the, of the Spirit, by, and then he lists them. Four to one manifestation of the Spirit. Spirit with manifestation for one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge according to the Spirit. To another faith, this is not faith that comes by hearing, another faith by the Spirit, this is a gift. Uh, to another gifts of healings of one Spirit, to another the effecting of miracles, and to another prophecy, and to another dis distinguishing, distinguishing of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, and to another interpretation of tongues. All right? He lists nine. Agreed? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Christ. We, we will count to nine. Got nine. Now, I'm not going to talk about those nine today. I'm not going to talk about them now. I'm going to talk about them later, though. But I'm going to talk about them today. But I want you to know they're called manifestation gifts of the Holy Spirit. Manifestation of the Holy Spirit, list nine. All right. But, but to one and the same Spirit. Now, here's the working of the Holy Spirit, his distributing gifts. But to one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually. Isn't that interesting? You don't have to say to each one individually unless you're making a big point. You could say to each one. That would cover it, wouldn't it, Billy? Or you could say individually. Wouldn't that cover it? You don't have to put those two things together if you cover that, but he did. And you know what he's teaching? There is no ungifted believers in the church age. Hello? To each one individually. <laughs> Could you, just in case you might miss to one. <laughs> well, I'm probably not that one. No, he didn't mean to one that way. And so Paul comes back, and he explains to one individually as he, the Holy Spirit, knows a capital H because he's the third member of the Godhead, as he wills. This just kind of interesting. Let's have a word of prayer, and I'm going to explain all that to you. Okay? I'm going to explain all that to you. Let's have a word of prayer. Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living, such is the case today in this Bible study. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. 
It could be mental attitude sins. It could be sins of the tongue or revert sins. It is your responsibility as a believer priest out of 1 Peter 2, 5 and 9, a believer priest to confess his sins because you are the redeemed of the Lord and you need to be a spiritual person. You can't live the Christian life in carnality. Evidence of carnality is a sin. The Holy Spirit will bring conviction of sin. The Word of God will bring conviction of sin. Your conscience will bring conviction of sin. What do I do with it? I confess it. 1 John 1, 9. My confession is not dealing with salvation. It's dealing with spirituality. Put me back into the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I confess my sin. 1 John 1, 9. He forgives me. He cleanses me. That is the work of Christ on the cross in regard to sin. He cleanses me to restore me to the ministry of the Holy Spirit, to spirituality. And so, our Father, we pray for that today in the life of our people, both here by automobile and by Internet. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of this lesson to our hearts about the regards of the ministry of the Holy Spirit in regard to our spiritual gift. It doesn't matter who we are or what gift we have. This is the way the Holy Spirit works with it. And so I pray, Father, you once again would reveal this and excite us, give us revelation that will release, Father, us the truth that will set us free from misunderstanding and from what Paul called agnosia or without knowledge. Not necessarily without the knowledge that there are spiritual gifts. Maybe not even without the knowledge that, there are, that, that we know what the gifts are. But they must function properly. They must function properly under spirituality. They must function properly. And they weren't functioning properly in the church of Corinth. They were having problems and divisions and confusion. And Paul has to come in and clear that up. And we're so thankful, Father, for that, for it helps us get clarity in our life about gifts. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, here we are. We're going to look at five things of the Holy Spirit's involvement based on verse 4, now explained by Paul in verses 7 through 11. So we're going to look at, I called it, what he called it in verse 11, he called it the distribution the distributing of spiritual gifts within the church. Okay? Spiritual gifts. I want to begin by taking a look at Paul's outline of the Holy Spirit's distribution of spiritual gifts in verses 7 through 11. What you, what you might not realize is that 7 through 11 is two Greek sentences. I, I forgot to look to see if the English did it. Verse 7 is a sentence. Verse 8, verse 9, verse 10, mm -mm, and verse 11. 8 through 11 is a sentence in the Greek. So we have in, in verses 7 through 11, we have two Greek sentences, which mean we have two main ideas going. Okay? Now, apparently what the English writers chose to do, what they chose to do was to make it into three sentences so that they could break up verses 8 through 10, which listed the nine gifts. I'm assuming that. I, I don't know because I wasn't present when they put all that together. But I'm assuming that. Now, in verse 7, we're told that spiritual gifts are the visible manifestation now, look at the Greek word. It has the definite article, hey, on the front of that. H-E is a definite article, which, may, which puts the spotlight on this word uh, for uh, manifestation. It puts a spotlight on that word, phanerois. Uh, this is a, a word that it deals with an appearance or a, a visible manifestation. These were... Visible manifestation. In other words, these nine gifts, you had no problem. Uh, they were identifying them. They were easily identified in assembly, in, in the ministry of the church. They were easily identified. Visible manifestation of the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. And, and notice what he says. 
He says, he says in verse 7, to one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Now, this word for is kind of interesting because in the Greek language, this word could be translated by a lot of different Greek words. The one Paul chose here is important because this is pros plus the accusative. Pros plus the accusative means with a view to something. Pros plus the accusative means with the view to something. Listen to what he says. He says, to each one individually, that's what he's talking about, to every church age believer, each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. All right, and then he's going to list the nine gifts because they were causing problems in the church. Chapters 13 and 14, they're causing problems in the church. V verse 25, they're causing division. There's confusion about it. And so, and so he, with a view to, with a view to, for the common good. But they weren't, they weren't being exercised for the common good. They were, they were destructive in the church. They were causing division, confusion, uh, problems. And spiritual gifts were not designed to cause problems. They were designed by God and given by a member of the Godhead for the common good. The word common good is made up of two Greek words, sum and ferrero. The word sum is actually the preposition soon, S-U-M, N. And it means together. And, it bring, and the pharaoh, pharaoh means to bring. It means to bring together for good, for, for a, a divine good. It means to bring together for divine good. Only good can come out of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It's for good. Spiritual gifts were designed to bring the body of Christ together in a unified manner. It identifies a healthy body. When all of the parts of the body are working in sympathy, in sympathy, symphony, symphony, in harmony, you have a healthy body. When one part or two parts don't want to work with the rest of the parts, <laughs> they get injured and they get into a suffering state, it affects, it gets out of. It's an unhealthy part. Right? <clears throat> That's the point. Gifts were never designed to bring suffering to the body, hurt to the body, they were designed to bring together the body in harmony, in unity. These gifts were given with the view, all these manifestation gifts, which people thought were spectacular, and they were spectacular, were not designed to separate us. It was designed to bring us together. But these spectacular gifts were causing problems. They were pushing people apart. And so Paul is writing this to clear up all that. He's trying to bring harmony back to the church through the word of God. Let me correct the error of your thinking. That's the point. And so we have it. We have this in uh, for the common good. Present active uh, participle. I laid that all, all out to you. Um, look down to verse 26 for a moment to talk about the harmony as opposed to when the body is out of harmony. Look at verse 26. If one member suffers, all members suffers. What's that? If one member is honored, all the members rejoice. See, that's the way it ought to be. See, even if one part is suffering, the rest of the part suffers with them. That's harmony. 
I mean, listen, we do, we do a pretty good job of that here. We probably could do a better job because we could use more people in the harmony of it. But those who have the growth to understand this stuff do a wonderful job. Our church does wonderful work in bereavement and all these kind of things. We're not one that just goes to the funeral and forget them. We really obligate ourselves to those in bereavement for a year at least um, to help them and walk them through and to pray for them and to be there for them. And we have teams in the church that, that minister to them. And that's a... And so this is what Paul's talking about. Gifts are there uh, to work the harmony of it, to work with a view to harmony, you, being unified, being brought together, being brought together to work in harmony with one another. <clears throat> you know, one of the things I liked about team sports as a kid growing up, it requires that. You can't have a good football team if everybody wants to do their own thing. You can't have a good basketball team if everybody wants. If one guy wants to be the hot shot, that team ain't going far. That team, one guy in the football field, what, it, same with the workplace, it's certainly in your marriage. But here it is as a necessity in the church. Harmony. Working as a unit. Working as a unit. Your gifts were designed. All of us with different gifts. Some of us are ears and eyes and nose and arms. And, and all working in harmony to keep the body healthy. That's Paul's point in, in verse 7. In verses 8, 9, and 10, <clears throat> he, he lists nine manifestation gifts. Here's what you don't see, I suppose, <clears throat> that we'll explain later. They're in four sets. They're in sets. Now, if you read chapter 13 and 14, you will come to realize that. <clears throat> They're in sets. For example, if you have the gift of tongues, you have to have the gift of interpretation. If you have the gift of prophecy, you have to have discerning spirits. These are in sets. There are four sets. And they're set up in the Greek language to show it to you. That they're in a series. And I will definitely show it to you. But it won't be today. <laughs> All right? But I will show it to you. I'm going to give you a heads up on it, though. I'm going to give you a heads up because I read ahead. I've actually exegeted chapter 13, all right? These nine manifestation spectacular gifts are partial. They're in four sets, and every one of them is partial gifts, every one of them. Think about that. Now, you won't know that until you get chapter 13, and you will see the problem when you don't recognize it. You see the problem that exists in chapter 14. Yeah? Yeah, I stirred some interest in you, didn't I? Yeah, I'm going to have to prove that to you, ain't I? And I'm up for the task, I can tell you that. In verse 11, in this outline, in verse 11, the Holy Spirit distributes. Now, here's what's missing. Now, I want you to pay attention to this word. <clears throat> de reo. See de reo? It's a present active participle. It's a verb. See, it ends in an O. That's a verb. But here's what you've missed if you haven't been paying attention. The Holy Spirit distributes a spiritual gift to each church age believer as a grace work. As a grace work. This word in the verb form is the same word that's used in verse 4, 5, and 6 by the word very. Variety, the variety, the word variety in the New American Standard. Uh, uh, William, what is it in the King James? Different? Different. Different. That's, fine. That's a fine translation. Different. It is this word. It's the noun form of this word that's used in verse 11. And did you notice the word ver uh, variety or different is used in verse 4? It's used in verse 5. It's used in verse 6, isn't it? 
It's used with every member of the Godhead. That word is used in the noun form. That's kind of interesting. Now, in verse 11, we're told that he, in verse 11, that the one and the same spirit works all these things distributing to each one individually. You don't have to do that, but he did it. He put ideas, meaning one, one own, on my own, and individually. One, one own, own, one, one. It's not the word one, is self. You know, you hear somebody, I'm my own man. Right? I'm my own person. Own. That's what this is. Listen, to each one, and listen, it's a grace work. You don't earn these gifts. You don't deserve them. You can't, you can't, uh, you can't um, exchange them. I wanted to. I'd have been the first to exchange them if I could have. You can't exchange them. You can't exchange them. Why? Because he, wor he works all these things. He works the distribution. He works the gifts. Your gift is not, your gift does, you have it, but it don't function in the flesh. It works under the, it doesn't work under the flesh. It works under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's distributed by the Holy Spirit. He takes up residence to function it. He lives inside you to function the gift. The, these gifts are spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3, you have to be spiritual for it to function. What, what does that mean, Ron? Listen, here's what it means. It means Galatians 5, 16. You got to walk in the Spirit. Your gift is not going to work if you don't walk in the Spirit. Now, but listen to me. Let me give you a positive. <laughs> that was a negative. Let me give you a positive. I hate negatives. So let me give you a positive. When you walk in the Spirit, your gift function, whether you know it or not, whether you know it or not. I want you to know what your gift is so that you can see it. So you can see it and understand it and know the value you have to the body of Christ, the church. I, I suppose that's why Paul did that. I mean, he wrote three chapters on this. Then he wrote the 12th chapter of Romans. Then he wrote Ephesians 4. I mean, it's a big deal to him. You, sir, you... You learn this, certainly as a pastor of a church, that the entire, listen to me, the entire program of a church as designed by God is spiritual gifts. When I was, uh, when I left Graham to go into a pastoral ministry with a desire to teach people the truth of the Word of God, because when I was traveling all over America, I saw the church was illiterate in the Word of God. And it stunned me, and it, it, broke, my, it broke my heart. Instead of complaining about it, God said, I want you to go into the church, and I want you to teach the truth of the Word of God, and I want you to build them out of a baby believer into an immature believer to a mature believer. And I understood the importance of spiritual gifts, and I understood this point of spiritual growth from milk to meat, milk doctrines to meat doctrines. When I was interviewed all over the United States, I knew a lot of people having traveled with Graham. I knew a lot of people. And when they found out I was going into the pastoral ministry, I got a lot of calls. I don't think there was anything boastful about it. I just got a lot of calls because I was well known with the Graham organization out in the field. I just worked with all these people. When I laid out what I thought was the church plan, I wanted to teach milk and meat doctrines and explain that. They thought I was nuts. 
when I said I wanted the entire program of the church to be about spiritual gifts, and we're going to scratch everything they had, and we were going to start over the way it was supposed to be done, after I gave a year, after a year, if they still wanted me, we were, we were going to do this after a year. I wasn't going to go in. And, after a year, if you like what I got to say after a year, I'll stay, but we, here are some things we got to do. I, the church has got to see that the church program is spiritual gifted ministries. Inside the church, it's all about gifts working one to another. The entire church body is made up of spiritual gifts. In chapter 12, we're going to learn that. And you know who's over that ministry? The Lord. Not, not somebody chosen by the congregation to be over it. He's been chosen by the divine plan of God. The Lord Jesus Christ sitting at the right hand of God, who is the Savior body, is the head of the church and runs the ministry of it. They thought I was nuts. <laughs> no, we run it. I went, no, no, you might think you do, and you might do it, but it's not a church. If you're running it, it's not the church. It's just a, a religious organization. So I realized this is going to be a hard task. So I came back home, and a, a group of high school and college kids said, we'll do it. Come be our pastor. We'll do it. We'll start right out and do it. And here we are 45 years later. This is how we've run our church. Spiritual gifts. Spiritually gifted ministries. And I'll tell you something wonderful. When, my, when our people, not mine, but when our people go out into other churches and have ministry with them, they know it. You're a phenomenal people. I don't tell you that way enough. Your ministry, your life in Christ is so phenomenal. We have been a great team. We are a great team. And we need more people engaged with us in the truth about the church of Jesus Christ. You need to bring your friends. They'll go like, oh, man, he, is, he, teaches, he teaches deep. I don't teach deep. I teach long. <laughs> I do teach long. I do teach long. Listen, I have so much to tell you. My heart is so filled with so much truth of the word of God to tell you that even an hour is difficult. It's not that I teach deep. I just teach the Word of God. If, if the Word of God is deep, it's deep. I don't know what, you, what, what they're talking about. I just teach long. <laughs> I think what they mean is he teaches too long, is what I think they mean. And I do know that. I know, I wish I could give it to you in 30 minutes, but you would wind up illiterate. You wouldn't have enough doctrine to come out of the rain, as they say. I know that. I, you know how I know it? Because of my own life. <laughs> my own life. I couldn't get it out of 30 minutes. I had to log hours in it. So, Here's another thing interesting in verse 11. He says, just as he wills. Do you see that? And who is the he? Holy Spirit, right? That's what we're talking about is the Holy Spirit. The word just as is an interesting word. 
It's a comparative, just as, you understand that's comparative, just as he wills. See, the word is bulamai. Now, let me show you something interesting, just as a sidebar, when we get to God. We're going to study about God in 18 through 31. Agreed? All right. So let's just drop over to 18, and let me show you something about the Godhead uh, and spiritual gifts. But now God has placed the members, each one of them. Now he's talking about the master plan. Listen, the Holy, the Holy Spirit is on one side doing it. God's on the other side doing it. As a master plan, God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body. What? Just as he pleased. Just as he desired. You know what that word is? Just as has got the same one. It's a comparative, same word. But he changed the last word. This is thalo. When I get to that God part, I'll t tell you about it. In other words, bulamai. Bulamai is working the plan of God out like a puzzle. You know, when you work a puzzle, if you're like my family, we go on vacations together. I know that might be hard to believe. I wouldn't want to go with anybody else. I have more fun with my family than anybody. Any, I'd rather be with my family than anybody. It's way too much fun. And we do puzzles. We do, I mean, they cover the, we get the big ones, you know. It's going to take, it's going to take the whole week to get it completed. And if it wasn't the cover of that thing, <laughs> if it wasn't the cover that gave us some clues, we'd never get that thing done. Because they're so big and complicated. I mean, every year now, the, these puzzles just get more complicated with too many colors and too many pieces. And everybody's got that lid up. And if you hit that lid, the game would be over. The difference between these two words is God has got the lid. And the Holy Spirit has got to operate the puzzle in time. Right? I mean, the East Church in his time lot. And he's got to work the puzzle together so that it looks like the... You know, what's interesting to me, I could find pieces that fit that <laughs> didn't belong there. Isn't that interesting? I could find pieces that would fit, and they, they'd put a couple on and they'd go like, that don't fit there. I, went, I just got it in there, and I didn't have to cut it or force it. <laughs> Sometimes I felt like getting a scissor and put it in there. Well, anyhow, it's just, it's just interesting. He says the same thing in the English, so to speak, and he uses two different words, bulamai and thalo. It's so good. This is such good stuff, people. I hope you're getting it. Point number two. We'll, we'll, we'll do number two and we'll take a break. You ready for a break? I know. I know. You, you would never tell me anyhow. I watch you shifting. And I know when I ought to take a break. I know you're shifting from one side to the other and you want to stand up and stretch and all that. One of the eight works of the Holy Spirit is salvation is distribute a spiritual gift. You know, a lot of churches, they learn about spiritual gifts, and then they think that somewhere down the road, you can just ask and get one. So they, get, they look at them all and say, well, I don't want that one. I don't want that one. I, I'll take this one. If I don't like it, can I give it back and exchange it? This is not a shirt that you're buying at Academy. I sure hope they take, do they, at Academy, take things back if you got your ticket? I hope so. So I got something I got to take back. That's why it's in my heart, I guess. It shouldn't be in yours, and I don't know why I told you. One of the eight works is to distribute a spiritual gift. One and the same spirit works all these things in the body. Works all these things. You know what all these things are? Different gifts. Distributing to each one, idios, individually, just as he wills. <laughs> so we, who are many, are one body in Christ, 
individual members one of another, some are arms, some's a foot, some's an ear. Since we have gifts that differ according, watch this now. Here's your word, Rick. Here's your word, grace. Not works. The one who works is the Holy Spirit. He works gifts, distributes and functions. He works gifts. You get the grace. It functions by grace. According to the grace given to us. Notice that's Romans 5, 5 and 6. These nine manifested spiritual gifts, some people refer to this manifestation as spectacular. I, I, Paul didn't call it that, but other people have. You'll hear people talk about the spectacular gifts, uh, but this is what they're referenced to. Paul called them manifestations or viv visible. There were some gifts that weren't as visible as others, uh, helps and things like that as compared. In other words, he lists nine that were in this. These nine manifested spiritual gifts were easily identified within the local body because of their manifestation. They were visible as the work of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Now, they saw them, but what they had to recognize that this was the working of the Holy Spirit. Spiritual gifts, the reason they're spiritual is the word spiritual. <laughs> they're given by the Holy Spirit. They operate by the Holy Spirit. They're spiritual gifts. This led, however, the fact that they could identify them as spectacular, people wanted them. And, and, and those that had it thought that others should have it. And that's not how this works. And it was causing problems. You will see it in chapter 13 and 14. A, a little bit of it's discussed in 25 briefly, like in verse 25. Divisions. It led to problems and divisions within the body of Christ, the church. And Paul discussed it in details, 13 and 14 chapters. In verse 25, he said, there should be no division in the body that there should be no division in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. Gifts were to unite you. They were to bring you together, not separate you. I mean, you, have, you know you have a body in trouble when you find parts laying all over the road. Right? That's what Paul is talking about. And listen, and he, he's going to explain the spiritual gifts are there for the good times, honor, and for the tough times, suffering. The gifts are there to serve us, not just when everything's going well, but when things are going rough and tough. The body of Christ is there to serve you. And, and, and listen, the, the body is served two ways. One is spiritual gifts, and the other is spiritual growth. And when you have this combination, you have an excellent ministry in church when you have that combination. The important doctrinal principle that I wanted to bring out to you is that all spiritual gifts are supernatural gifts. They're supernatural. They're not natural. Natural, you could do them in the flesh. These are supernatural. They can only operate in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. They are supernatural. They're supernatural. There are supernatural gifted ministries and not natural talents or abilities. For example, I am often hear somebody will, go, will, will be in the teaching field. They have gone to school, they have been trained, and they have functioned as a teacher for a few years. Everybody thinks they have the gift to teacher. They may have. Or they may not have. The fact that they went and taught in a public school or a university doesn't have anything to do with his gift. The gift is for the church. Do you understand that? It's not for a public school. It's not for a university. You could have it there, and you would see it there if there was a group of Christian people there that you were ministering to. Do you understand? 
And it would have nothing to do with what you were degreed in. You, like Kurt, you could be a history teacher. And you meet at the what we used to call the co-op, where kids hang out and have a Coke and a hamburger. And there he would sit down, open the Bible, and teach a group of kids who want to learn the scripture. If he had the gift of teacher. It wasn't because he was a teacher. It was because he was gifted to be a teacher. His, his, his book would be, not be a history book. It would be the Bible. He might, be, he might love the history of it and want to teach them history from the Bible, but it would cause spiritual growth in their life. Some person will think that a person has been trained well, has gone through school after school on how to be a great leader, and has worked in the field as a great leader in some capacity, and they think he has the gift of leadership. Maybe not. Maybe. It depends on how it works in the church, not how it works in the industrial world, the business world. That's not how these things work. They are designed for the church, not for the world. For the church. And so that's really important that we understand that. They are supernaturally gifts. They're not natural abilities or talents. Spiritual gifts are part of the salvation package of 50 things that you receive at salvation. <clears throat> Your gift is given to you at salvation. It's one of the eight works of the Holy Spirit. He, the Holy Spirit, He works these. He works all things. All these things. He works all these things. I can't. You know, I kid with you a lot. If you haven't found your gift by the end of the spiritual gifts, I'll give you one. <laughs> I'm joking. I will help you. I will try to help you find it. But, you know, I'm kidding with you when I say, if you haven't found one, I'm going to give you one. <laughs> of course, I'm kidding with you. Uh, even you know I'm not the Holy Spirit. Even you know that. Here's another thing that's confused about it that shouldn't be. Spiritual gifts are not the same thing as fruit of the Spirit. These are two separate deals. Spiritual gifts are not the same thing as fruit of the Spirit. For in Galatians 5, 22, 23, there are nine fruit listed. These are not the same thing as spiritual gifts. When he's talking about the nine gifts over here, they're not, he's not equating that these are anything like the nine fruit. People get all that confused. Remember also, I hear pastors, they, they teach from Romans, and they say the gifts that listed in Romans are, are the gifts. And, the, and they say that's all there is. Well, that's crazy because you've got gifts listed in Romans 12, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 12, and Ephesians 4. You have to put them all together and uh, see how many you have. I counted 19. Anybody who goes to Greek class where we do a lot of counting knows they better check my math. <laughs> they better check my math because I seem to always be wrong as a teacher on math. So, but you need to be, you need to understand some of the things that the Holy Spirit is, has given to us is distinctly unique, and that's spiritual gifts. In Galatians 5.16, Paul tells you to walk in the Spirit. That's how you're spiritual. How do you know that I am spiritual? Well, you were born again to be spiritual. You have the Holy Spirit that makes you spiritual. You don't make yourself spiritual. You don't do a bunch of works and say, that makes me spiritual. Well, I go to church, I give my money, I teach, I do this, I do it, therefore I'm spiritual. Uh-uh. None of that stuff makes you spiritual. Those are the things you do because you are spiritual. They don't make you spiritual. What makes you spiritual is walking in the Holy Spirit. Now, when you read Galatians 5.16, the word is walk is peripateo. I've explained it many times to you. If you drew a circle on your paper and put a dot in the middle, that would be the dot would be you, and the rest of that circle you would begin to divide up into all the areas of your life. You're a husband, you're a son, you're a brother, you have a job, you go to church, 
you're a neighbor, yada, yada. All the things that make up your life are inside that circle. And peri pateo means you're to walk in the spirit around, around that circle in every avenue of that circle on the inside. That pie is where you walk. That's your life. Walking in the Spirit is walking out the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. You walk by means of the Holy Spirit. Now, another thing is that word walk, peripateo, in Galatians 5.16, is a command. It's an imperative. It's a present imperative. That's a command in the Greek language. It, this is not a suggestion that you walk. It's a command. Look, next time draw a little, draw a circle on your paper and put it out in the middle and draw your, just take a look at your life. Say every, every little piece of that pie is unique. You've got friends, put a friend, I got a job, I go to church, I got this. Draw it, see how many you have. You'd be surprised how many, how many pieces of pie you have. It'll be apple, of course. You'd be surprised. And there's your influence of your life upon Christ to other people. You really need to take a look at that. You really need to take a look at that. Because you're commanded to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit in these areas. And listen. Listen. When you make that pie out, this is why I want you to do that. I want you to make that pie out. Then I want you to come back, and I want you to color the pies where you are really struggling with it. For example, marriage. Rod, you... This is what I hear. Rod... You have no idea how difficult it is to walk in the spirit in my marriage. I say, all the time, once a week, once a month. <laughs> and if they say, if they say all the time or most of the time or something, I say, color it red. And if something's good, doing really good, color it blue. And if it's yellow, color it yellow because it's, there's kind of like a warning sign. You know, it's one thing to hear me say you're commanded to walk in the Spirit. It's another thing to actually do it. That's when the rubber hits the pavement. And do you know these areas that you color red is where your greatest ministry is and you're neglecting it? The red, not the blue, the red. And if you'll be honest and go like, my marriage is in trouble, my family's in trouble, my work's in trouble, my this is in trouble, write them down. Write them down. Because these are the areas your present life needs victory in. And you're not going to find victory in them in the flesh. You're only going to find them by walking in the spirit. And you've got to put that upstairs in your mind. I've got to walk in the spirit. I hate my job. Was that the same job you loved when you got it? Was that the job you were excited when you got it? Yeah. Well, what's happened? Well, you don't understand. The boss is this, and they put me so much on me and all that. And I went, where's the ministry? Ministry, I don't even have time to breathe. Do you know you're supposed to walk in the Spirit on the job? And if you want to find the fruit of the Spirit, you've got to walk in the Spirit, because when you do, there's joy, there's peace. You go back and look at the nine fruit. When you, when you put red on your paper in those little pieces of pine, you put red... You put up above that Galatians 5, 16, and 22 through 23. And the very things that you're missing, I, I, I don't have joy anymore. I don't have this and I don't have that. You're going to find them in the fruit of the Spirit without exception. 
I need peace. I need patience. I need this. I need that. There it is. You don't understand. I have a barn full. I know. You ought to do this and be reality because this is, you know, this is where it is. And listen, when you got many red things, it's, it's, you need to come see me. If you got too many red things, you need to come see me or see Al or see one of the guys. You need to come see us. Because you're missing the simplicity of your walk. And listen, you live in a church, listen, you come to a church that loves you and wants only the best for your life. And we're, we're fully equipped to help you. There are women in this church can help you. If you're a, a woman or a young woman and you're struggling in some areas, we're filled with mature women in this church that would love to talk with you and minister to you and help you and get you from point A to point B. Listen, if you're not getting us because you're not asking, Ask, seek, and knock, and you get it. Well, anyhow, that was that little that little episode was free. Uh, you may not have liked it, but it was given anyhow. The Greek word for dis distribution is the same Greek word as variety or differences. One's a verb and one's a noun. They both refer they both refer to dividing into parts. You go like, well, what's the word mean? Here's what they mean. Here's the root of the meaning, divided into parts. Divided into parts. The church is divided into parts which are called gifts. Everybody has one. That's, that's your nomenclature. I'm an arm, I'm a leg, I'm an eye. That's your nomenclature in the body of Christ, a nomenclature of great ministry. Great ministry. The church of Jesus Christ is divided into spiritually gifted members. In 1 Corinthians 12, 27, in the God part, it says, now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. Isn't that interesting? You're part of a body. We're all body, and yet we're uniquely a member of it. I'm an arm, I'm a leg, I'm an ear, I'm an eye. And your gift is not to serve you, it's to serve the body. Your eye is not for the eye, it's for the body. In 1 first, in first Corinthians 12, 24, in the God part, it says, God so composed the body, giving honor to the members which lacked. The spectacular ones you can see, oh, what pretty hair you have. Oh, what big teeth you have. Why are you wearing that little red suit? That's visible. How about the ones that aren't? How about the liver, the heart, the spleen, the colon? Can't see those. Ain't that good? The fact that you can't see them, does it make them less important to the body? Absolutely not. Every gift is important to the body, to the function of health. That's what, and God composed it. God so composed the body in such a way. Your part in the body of Christ, the church, is your spiritually gifted ministry, the point of chapters 12, 13, and 14. Next week, next week, we will learn the importance of the Holy Spirit baptizing every church-age believer into Christ and into the body of Christ at the moment of salvation. Oh, did you get that? Nah. You should. See that little diagram at the bottom of your paper? Underneath the cross... Write Colossians 1.3, 1 Corinthians 15.3 and 4, Romans 1.16, Ephesians 2.8 and 9. That's how you get saved. 
That symbol is death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. The moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you receive eight works of the Holy Spirit. One of those is BHS. Is that on your paper? Do I have BHS? Okay. See, for, draw a line from the cross to the top circle. Did I do that? Yes. On that line that goes from the cross to the top circle, write BHS, Baptism of the Holy Spirit. In that circle, in that top circle, right into Christ. You are baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ. He said, where is Christ? Top circle. He's seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven today. Agreed? Of course. <laughs> of course. I mean, were you baptized into Christ? Where is he? Seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. Now, I want you to open your Bibles to Galatians. We're in Corinthians, so it would be easy. Go through second into Galatians, the third chapter in verse 27. Here's what it says. For all. Does your Bible say all or some? Well, then don't call it some. If the Bible calls it all, don't call it some. It means everyone, individually. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. You know, what that, you know what the idea is? You're, you, you're clothed in Christ means the 20 status privileges. Through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you receive 20 status privileges that, that are your identity in Christ. You know that pamphlet, 50 things? They identify them. You need to make sure you know that pamphlet of 50 things. That's dynamite. The 20 status privileges... The status privileges, the 20 things, is what you is who you are in Christ. He's a son, you're a son, priest, priest, eternal life, eternal life. All of that, all of that. You know, now, did I I you got that up there? You got Galatians 3.23? I'm baptized into what? Into Christ. And I'm clothed with Christ because of it. All right? We call that, listen to me now, we call it positional sanctification. I just recently, I say recently, um, I did a study on my Wednesday study that have lunch with us on Wednesday, breaking bread on Wednesday. We did a whole study on positional sanctification. We call it sanctified in Christ out of Corinthians what it means to be sanctified in Christ. Positional sanctification. There's positional sanctification in Christ. There's progressive sanctification, the ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life, working with the Word of God. And there's, there's permanent, that is the believer in eternity with Christ. There's positional sanctification, progressive sanctification, and permanent sanctification. One and three go together. If you're saved, if you have positional, you have permanent. But the in-between that is progressive. Are you walking in the Spirit? Sanctification is being set apart unto the holiness of God. You need to go back and pick that Wednesday night study up if you haven't studied it. Now, is there a circle underneath that top circle? Yes. Is there a line? Yes. A line drawn from the top circle to the bottom circle? Now, I want you to understand something. The bottom circle means into the body, right? Into the body of Christ, into the body of Christ. That's the church. The moment you are baptized into Christ, you are baptized into the body of Christ. That's his job. That He said he would do that. That's at Matthew 3, 11 and 12. That's discussed in John 14, 15, uh, John 14, 15 and 16. Now, go back with me to Corinthians 12, where we will be next week in verse 12, 13. 
Next week we'll be in this when we talk about the Lord and the body, the church. Now watch this. This is important. You see this. For by one spirit, Holy Spirit, that's capital S, for by one spirit we were all, does it say some or all? <laughs> I know. We are all, we were all, we were all, we were all at point of salvation baptized into one body. Do you see that? When I'm baptized by the Holy Spirit, when I'm baptized into Christ, I'm baptized into his body. See, that's discussed by Paul. That even, even the book of Acts talks about this as the church age begins where the church becomes visible. You see that? For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. And look, under, did you write down positional sanctification or breathe the aid or do something? This is still part of that. That positional sanctification that put me in Christ also put me in the body. That's all part of positional sanctification. All of that's positional. Now, underneath that, underneath positional sanctification, I want you to write the word equality in Christ. Equal I want you to write equality in Christ. This is what Paul meant when he said in 1 Corinthians uh, 12, 13, we are all baptized in water, whether you're a Jew or a Greek, Gentile, whether you're a slave or free, we were all made to drink of one spirit. Equality in Christ. Equality in Christ. We have worked 45 years hard to make you understand this basic principle. It's a grace. Equality in Christ is a principle of grace. It's not based on who, who and what you are in the world. It's who and what you are in Christ. It's all positional. And we should treat people that way. No black, no white, no red, no yellow. No rich, no poor. No educated, uneducated. None of that foolishness. None of that, none of that, none of that. That's social, that's cultural, it's not scriptural in the church. By the way, he said that in Galatians 3.27 too and 28. In, in, in verse 28 of that chapter, he says the same thing about equality in Christ. He says the same thing, equality in Christ. Equality in Christ. We all have different gifts, but we're, all the gifts serve the body of Christ. We're one body, different gifts, but one body. And how important that is. Equality in Christ. Write these verses down on positional sanctification because some of you uh, that weren't, weren't, are not able to come on Wednesday. If you're able to come to lunch on Wednesday from 1130 to 1230, come on. We don't have child care, though. But, uh, but listen, bring them. I don't care. Bring them. I don't care. You have to hold them and feed them and all that, but I can't do that. Here's the scriptures, and we'll go home. Oh, I looked up, and it's time. <laughs> I'm going to give you the scriptures. I thought I was going to let you out early, but it looks like I'm not. I want you to write down 2 Thessalonians 2.13. These are a positional sanctification by the Holy Spirit. I want you to write down Hebrews 12.14. Without sanctification, you will never see God. How about that? Hebrews 12, 4. Without sanctification, you will never see God. Without sanctification, boy, that'll preach. Hey, Billy, we need to put that on the street. Right? Let's go fishing with that hook. That's a good bait. Romans 15, 16. Sanctification. 1 Peter 1, 2. Sanctification. You know what they all tell you? You're sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Oh, 
All right, let's close in prayer. And Rick, you'll pledge us out of here and we'll go home. I want to thank you for coming. You're the best students, I'll tell you. You're the best students. Nobody wants to sleep on me today. That was good. You know, I don't mind if you sleep if you don't snore. As long as you don't snore. If you snore, I got to wake you up. No, I can't. Can't have you snoring. Father, we're so thankful for these that have come our way to study with us so faithfully. Teach us, Father, about spiritual gifts and the dy dynamics they have in our life of the church. Show us, Father, the correct way to think about them. Let, let us not come with preconceived ideas that are not scriptural. Teach us the truth and let the truth set us free about spiritual gifts, Father, in our church. I, again, Father, I pray for those in our church who are sick and especially those who just have a, a unique and special place. I know Debbie Phillips' family is in some serious stuff. I lift them before you today, Father, and I pray for them. That sweet Jeannie, I lift her before you, Father, and I pray you would heal her wound. Teach her the great lessons that come with it and for her, her, her wonderful family. I pray for Jean. I lift her before you as a caregiver, Father. What a, what a deep struggle sometimes that can be in a life of a believer, no matter how spiritual they are. To find some time within themselves for their own identity. There's so many, Father. For those who are bereaved, who have lost a significant part of their life and a mate and are struggling, Father, with how to go on and all the paperwork and all the things that go with just death. And trying to find in there some way to find one's own identity alone. How do, how do we recover from that? I pray, Father, that we'd be a church that would be willing to take them down the road and walk with them and teach them. And if they're a woman, they've got a wonderful group of ladies in this church, just wonderful, mature women who are just filled with ministry. And men, men who we meet every, every first now and third for prayer, just godly men. Not without, not without struggles in our own life, but a desire to live it, a desire to minister to others. Make us fishers of men, as Billy reminded me today, the importance of being fishers of men. And that's, we fish outside the church. Where is that fishing hole? Show us those fishing holes, Father. Show us all the fishing holes, not just one or two, but show them all to us. May we have the heart to do it, Father. Be fishers of men. In Jesus' name, amen.